In chapter one, uh, a couple weeks ago, we were studying this, and James tells us right there at the end, the very last verse, that pure religion is to minister to the suffering. It's to visit the orphan and the widow in their distress. Of course, we talked about how the orphan and the widow were just two dominant people groups in ancient times that were overlooked, abused, and misused. And so that's why they're mentioned quite extensively throughout the Bible. But in the Old Testament, there are many other groups that are mentioned that are struggling and suffering. And God, of course, through his word, wants his people to care about the things that he cares about. He cares about the suffering. He cares about those that are overlooked. He does not overlook those that are struggling and suffering. And so James is just simply reiterating what the Old Testament says and also what the Lord Jesus said. So we studied that, and, and I just, as I was thinking about this, I don't think there's anybody that's a Christian, obviously, or a follower of God, that would disagree that this is something that we ought to do. If I were to say to you today, should we care for the suffering and the struggling? Yes. Yeah, I, I don't think there's one person that goes, no, I don't think so, kind of overrated. <laughs> it's just not what we would say. It's not our heart, because it's God's heart. We know it's God's heart. If it's God's heart, it's supposed to be our heart. And so certainly we see that the scriptures admonish, admonish us, encourage us, even command us to care for the things that God cares for. So here's what I'd say to you today is we don't have a belief problem. We have a behavior problem. It's not our belief that James is going after. It's not our belief. We all believe this is right. The people that James was writing to believes, yes, we should help the suffering. We should care for the widow. We should care for the orphan, of course. But it wasn't a belief problem he was going after. They all agreed. It was a behavior problem. They just simply weren't doing it. And I think the same can be true for us today. And if we are honest today, we would probably admit that we don't always seek to and we don't always stop to help those that are in need. And there's something in us, in this, our humanity, that can overlook suffering. We can overlook somebody who needs help. We can overlook meeting a need. There's this thing, this hesitation, this reluctancy, and it's not just that we're busy. It's not just that we're in a hurry. There are reasons as to why we actually overlook people in their distress. And you could ask the question, why do we do that and what is it? Well, James chapter two, is, he's gonna go after it. He tells them that this is something that they need to do. Obviously, the same is true for us. But then in chapter two, he goes after mindsets and practices that hinder us from doing the very thing that God tells us to and that we want to do because we know it's God's heart. And now, because we're born again, it's our heart as well. But there are reasons, there are mindsets that we have. There are practices that are in place that he wants to go after here and does in chapter two. And one of those mindsets and practices that hinder us from ministering to the suffering is what James calls favoritism. That's what we're gonna look at today in these verses. And I would tell you that it's really important to go through books of the Bible. I do wanna do topical series at times. We need to hit cultural issues and if you just go through books of the Bible, you can't hit everything. But the reason, one of the main reasons we go through books of the Bible is you have to study passages that you would never bring up. When you cherry pick verses, you just simply will never get to some of these things. And so it's important for us. I would not have chosen this. Maybe for a cultural issue, maybe for a political issue. And that's the problem, isn't it? Sometimes we look up verses and we study scripture for a reason. So we already have a filter on our eyes when we start to read it. And that can be, uh, that can be a problem. So I hope today as we study and read this, that we just sim simply go after it contextually and learn what God intends for us to learn. So with that said, James chapter two and verse one, and this is how it reads. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes, and say, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there or just sit by my footstool. This is, I guess it's a hypothetical, but that's kind of wild. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. 
Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, and just to be clear, partiality is the same word, favoritism. So they're synonymous terms. If you show favoritism or partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law or the whole law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty, for judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy, for mercy triumphs over judgment. Amen. This is the word of the Lord today. James says it quite clearly that favoritism is a sin. It's a sin. It's probably not a sin that we bring up all the time. I think in the background, we certainly think of it. We know it's wrong. We know it's a sin, but he goes after it. I think part of the problem, maybe to translate this to our culture, is that we don't often use the word favoritism. It's really not a word that I use. Like when I'm raising my, with raising my kids, I don't sit them down and have some big ordeal in correcting them. Like, you know what? You guys are sinning in favoritism. <laughs> but there are times when raising kids, there are times when we live life that favoritism is a part of what we experience and we speak to it. I just don't know that we use those terms. So I started looking at all the other Bible translations and they use words like partiality. Well, I don't use that word either. And then sometimes it'll say respecter of persons. Remember, Jesus is no respecter of persons. So these are also terms that, that I don't use when thinking of favoritism, so it's not helpful. So I wanna give a definition and this def definition isn't bulletproof, but it is helpful. And here's the definition, what I think that he's talking about. Favoritism is giving unfair preferential treatment to someone based on personal prejudice. Now, I want to add an addendum. Favoritism is not always based on personal prejudice, but it often is. It often is. And this is, I think, is the secret. Now, let me, let me use some words here that I think translate to our culture. Favoritism is fueled often by personal prejudice. Personal prejudice is to prejudge. It's to have a preconceived judgment or opinion about someone or a group of people or something. And if we were to look at biblical words, we would look at Matthew chapter seven. This is where Jesus says, do not judge lest you be judged. He's talking about looking down on others or prejudging people with a sense of finality. So he's not saying don't discern. He's not saying you can't have judgments. He's talking about the way and the purpose for which we would judge others, where it's not our place to do so. There are judgments we're not supposed to make. There are judgments that we're supposed to make. So if you look at a biblical word for like prejudice, it would be, it would be similar to the word judgment. Once again, these words don't always make it to our dinner table. So the word prejudice uh, means to be pre, have a preconceived judgment about someone or something. Prejudice leads to discrimination. That's a word that we use. We use the word discrimination a lot. Prejudice leads to discrimination. Discrimination is unfair and unequal treatment, which is thoroughly condemned in the Bible. Uh, we see this all over the place. There are a lot of different words that would encapsulate what we're talking about when we use the word discrimination. But there are translations when looking at James chapter two that actually just flat out use the word discriminate. Don't discriminate against some as you're elevating others. So this is what we could ask. I mean, we could say, well, let me explain it this way. Favoritism is like an umbrella term that includes prejudice and also discrimination. It assumes there's a prejudice already. And here's what kind of happens, okay? Because people don't obviously think they're discriminating against people. But what James is presenting here is this idea. When you elevate others in an unfair and unequal way, you automatically discriminate people who deserve equality. 
And this is why some people will say, well, I didn't say anything about that person and I didn't do anything to that person. But where people deserve equality, if we, for whatever reason, in an unfair way, are lifting up some, we are automatically committing discrimination against others. And we can be very blind to the fact that this goes on all all of the time. Let me ask you a question real quickly. Have you ever been discriminated against? Raise your hand. Okay, it should be every hand, guys, come on. It should be every hand. I believe everyone has been discriminated against. Some of us have been discriminated against more than the rest, for sure, for sure. There's all kinds of reasons that we get discriminated against. It could be our race, it could be our ethnicity, our age, our gender, our weight. It could be our clothes. That's the case study that he brings up here in James 2. Could be our background, where we come from. It could be our beliefs. It could be our politics. It could be a number of things. It could be the rumors that have been spread about us that are are categorically untrue. Come on, somebody. We can be discriminated against for things that are absolutely not even true of us. Now, to park right there for a second, there are reasons to treat people differently at times. The Bible would call that honor. So it's not discrimination if I treat my wife differently than I treat other women. Obviously, it's the relationship that I have with her. The Bible says that we are called to honor our parents, that we're called to honor leadership, that we're called to honor those in authority. So in a sense, we don't give them unfair, unequal treatment but we give them honor. So there is a sense in which we give honor to people. But when we go beyond that with an evil motive, as James says, this is where favoritism actually brings destruction in our world because it robs the community that we're a part of of biblical equality. And God sees everyone the same. God loves everyone the same. When we come into Christ, we're sons and we're daughters of God. He loves us just the same and he treats us just the same. So the sin of favoritism is uh, is evil from top to bottom and it comes with these motives, these opinions. And that's what James is is getting at. Let let me give you an illustration. This is (laughs) just, just a silly illustration, but maybe you'll laugh and say that that was just silly. So... For that reason, I'll, sh- I'll share it. Okay, let's say you go, you're at the airport in 1980, because I'm gonna use the dollar term, and now I think things cost $20, but don't ruin my illustration. So let's say you're at the airport, and you wanna get a Coke. So you go up to the vending machine, and there's a person in front of you, and that person pulls out a nice crisp dollar bill, all right, when Cokes used to cost a buck. They pull out a crisp dollar bill and they, and they send it through the vending machine and it goes in there and out pops this ice cold Coca-Cola and they crack it right in front of you and they drink just like they do on the commercials. Ah! And the polar bear jumps out of somewhere and everybody has a dance party, right? It's amazing. And you're so excited. You're like, man, I can't wait to get my ice cold polar ice Coke. And so you step up and you pull out your crinkled damage, slightly stepped on. This one actually has tape in it. You pull out your, your dollar, and with a little bit of faith, you send that thing through the vending machine, and what happens? Comes back out. And so you, you say, man, something, they just might, we're speaking a different language. Something must be off here. So you send that thing back in thinking something's going to change. Did it change? No. So now you're like, You send it, what does it do? Comes back. Some of you are still bitter about this, right? (laughs) You need to get some healing. You send it. You keep sending the thing like something is going to change. And and, and you're angry. And so as a good Christian, you do an air kick because you won't really kick the thing. And and you want to say words that that shouldn't come out of your mouth, and hopefully you don't. But you get, really, you get upset. Anybody got upset? You want that ice cold Coke. You want to have a polar bear dance party. You want, you... You're about to get on a plane, baby. You want something to drink. And you saw him, and he had it, and it was wonderful. But now you can't have the the same thing. Why are you upset? Why are you mad? Because according to the Federal Reserve, your dirty, nasty, stinky dollar is worth the same amount as his crisp, clean dollar that was just printed. And somebody has decided to discriminate against you. Some demonic value system has chosen to reject. Come on, somebody. This will preach today. 
Somebody has made a choice to reject your dollar over their dollar when you know that the value is the same. Come on, some, oh man. Mm. Feel like John Hammer last week, you know. I gotta take breaks while I preach. Give that man some air, you know, all right. So a decision gets made, and I think this is a funny illustration to say there's an equal claim on each dollar. They're both worth the same, and yet there's, one is rejected. One is rejected, and I think that's how a lot of people feel in our world because there are people, there are systems, there are structures, all kinds. I'm not getting political here. I'm just saying there are, this really happens in our world. Favoritism happens, and it causes some to feel rejected. And here's what James says. You got to be mindful of that. You got to be mindful of that. There are people that are struggling, that are suffering, and God's people are called to care for and lift up. That's what he's talking about. And so as I read this passage, I'm thinking about four things that he brings up that showing favoritism causes, in turn, it's a, ne- a negative consequence in our world. So here's the first one. Showing favoritism opposes the example of Jesus. Look at verse one. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? Wow. James may not be asking for an answer, but he is challenging them to reconcile the very clear contrast. There is a contrast here. You claim to have faith in Jesus and you behave entirely different from the one that you're following. How can you claim this and live like that? So, and that's the issue, isn't it, in James? James goes after this again and again, and the next time we study the rest of the chapter two, it gets even worse. I mean, he just goes after people, and he's saying this, is Christianity, is Christianity primarily about believing in Jesus, or is there more to it than that? Is it just about believing? Can we believe in him and not behave like him? Can we do that? See, this is what James is talking about. Can you believe in and say you follow someone, but you don't behave like him, or you're not even attempting to? There's something callous in your heart, and that's why he's talking about it. Like I told you, we all agree, care for the suffering, all that, but not all do. That's, that's, what, he's, that's what he's after. And here's why. Here's what I think is at the core of, of what all this is, um, is about, is we want something in this world. We want something from people. We have selfish motives, and so we end up showing favoritism to some because we have a selfish motive for us. We want something from people. Jesus was entirely different. He came to give to people, not to take from them. This is the contrast of his example over so many, uh, so many of us or so many people in the world. That's sin. That's what sin has, has done. Scripture says about Jesus, he was no respecter of persons, which means he treated people fairly and equally. He always did this. Some examples would be the poor widow who gave her might, even the way that he saw her. He told his disciples, did you, he asked them, did you see that? And they're like, see what? The widow who gave her might, she just gave nothing, like two pennies into the offering. And there are all these Pharisees, religious leaders, and everyone else, they're giving large amounts into the donation. They're giving so much money, and everybody is seeing that. They can even hear it. They can hear the donations being, being given because it was coinage. And Jesus says, did you see that when she gave? And they couldn't even... They couldn't even see it. But his mindset, the way that he looked at people was so different. It started with the way that he, that he saw people. Jesus called Matthew, who was a tax collector. He called Simon, who was a zealot, and he treated them different than their community. He saw people different. The woman at the well, nobody was gonna talk with her, have community with her, be in her circle. The Gentile woman at Sychar, Jesus engaged them when others wouldn't, and he talked to them when others didn't. This is what Jesus was like. He went out of his way to engage. He treated people fairly and equally. He didn't just stop to do it, he sought to do it. It's very different. It's one thing to say, I'll wait for an opportunity. It's another thing to be looking for that opportunity. And I believe that's what Jesus did. He came from heaven to earth to give his life as a ransom for, for many. Now, we're prone to judge by outward appearance, social status, past behaviors, but Jesus does not do that. And so James gives an example 
It's a theoretical story. This, this is something that could happen. Here's what he says. Basically, two people come into your church. One is rich and well-dressed. The other is poor with dirty clothes. And you pay special attention to the one and you tolerate or you dismiss the other. So he brings this up. Then he concludes by saying, have you not made distinctions among yourself and become judges with evil motives? When we show favoritism, it carries an evil motive for sure. That's what James is talking about. For example, if we were to show favoritism toward the rich and famous, that's the case study that he gives. If we show favoritism towards the rich and famous, it's probably because we want to be rich and famous. We want something from them. Why would we elevate them over others? We want something that they have. That's our perception. Friends, have you ever felt that evil thing lurking in you? You want to rub shoulders with someone, get a little close to someone, and it has to do with what you might hopefully get from them? Come on, you live in the world that I do. It happens. I've had this happen 100%. 100%. And, uh, and I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed of it. But you know what? Misery loves company, and I think you're like me, so let's just talk about it for a second. <laughs> it's comforting, you know, when you're standing in a group of sinners. It's, uh, it's comforting. <laughs> and I'm just, yes, we all, you know, we all struggle with different things. Um, and, and hopefully, by God's grace, he grows us out of, out of one thing, and then we start dealing with uh, another that's not encouraging, but it is true. <laughs> That's not encouraging, <laughs> but, but, it, but, it's, but it's true. And the older you get, I think the more honest you get if you spend time with God. The older you get, the more honest you get. You're like, wow, I didn't, I didn't see that. Wow. Can I encourage you real quickly about something too? This is maybe, I don't think it's off topic. I think we have a tendency also as Christians, the longer that we know the Lord, we have this tendency to hear and read the word for other people. That's unfortunate. I actually was tempted this week to do that in this passage. I was tempted this week to think, you know what? I don't show favoritism. And that's, that's the word of a blind person. I don't show favor. See, when you conclude, I don't do something, you're shutting the door to possible healing and transformation. Because we're automatically saying, instead of asking the one who knows our hearts when we don't know our hearts, we're automatically saying, this isn't my struggle, I don't need to hear this, but man, a lot of other people do. <laughs> a lot of other people do, but here's the thing, man. When you really wanna grow and you just be humble before God, Lord, if there's any of this in me, show me so that I can, you can excavate my heart, deal with this thing, get it out of my life. And I don't just want to not show favoritism. I actually want to go after the people that you see and you say, don't overlook. That, that's the point, right? That's the point. And so as we think about what favoritism is like, it's opposite of the example of Jesus. We want something. It's selfish. It opposes his example because we know that Jesus was selfless. And so here's an application point. Look at everyone through the eyes of Christ Ask the Lord, how do you see this person? How do you want me to see people? It's easy to polarize ourselves from others. Um, we're in a new election cycle, and friends, I couldn't feel more different politically than, than some. Honestly, I just, I just couldn't. I'm just telling you me. You know, I'm not going to you know, bring out the ballots right now. But just me personally, I couldn't feel more different politically than some. But that doesn't mean I'm supposed to discriminate against them. I'm supposed to pray for, I'm supposed to still be able to speak with friends. And this is a problem. Jesus is not our filter. Something else becomes our filter and it shuts down our ability to minister and see people as God does. We can disagree. We should disagree. But I'll tell you this. Um, if we can't disagree with people and somehow still minister, we're not free at all. We talk about freedom of speech and I, I totally am with that. Yes, amen. Would f fight for that freedom. But free speech should not disclude us being Christians and loving people even when we disagree. That's not freedom at all. It's, it's, just, it's just not. So yes, I'm very concerned <laughs> that Christ isn't our pure and fundamental filter, um, even in our differences and disagreements with, uh, with a world that's going an opposite, opposite way, antithetical to the gospel. Here's the second, uh, go ahead and smile. Go ahead, do it. <laughs> Come on. Are you with me? Number two, showing favoritism denies the grace of God. 
Verse five, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Here James reminds them that they were and probably still are poor and God did not overlook them. And here's what he's saying. If God didn't overlook you, then why would you mistreat people that I've called you not to overlook? Freely as you have received, freely you shall give. Think about other people are in, are in the same disposition that you were in. In those days, the rich exploited the poor by influencing the courts, and they did so for their own gain. They made themselves richer, and nothing has changed. Nothing has changed today. Wicked people build systems to control, control exploit, use, abuse, and, and quite frankly, to play God. People want control for these, for these reasons. Favoritism upholds such type of wickedness. Instead of ministering to those who suffer and see those who are unseen, it, it only cares for this top tier type of person. And, and here's what I would tell you is, I, I, I'm not saying we don't minister to people who are rich in this, in, in, in this age. The grace of God doesn't, uh, doesn't just reach up. It doesn't just reach down. It reaches across. And whomever will reach back, those are the ones that God ministers to. It isn't about money. It's never about money. It's about grace. It's about grace. So as we've received grace, we want to give grace, Not, whether it's poor or rich, but anybody that God calls us to who's in our sphere of influence. The grace of God breaks down walls of separation that humans build in every generation. That's what God did for us in Christ. How many of you are thankful for the grace of God today? There's an interesting thing that happens when we become a Christian, we get saved the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us. We're born again. We're brand new. We're excited. We're so thankful for the grace of God. Do you guys remember that? You're so thankful for the grace of God. I didn't earn it. I don't deserve it. He could have overlooked me, but he didn't. It feels like God chased you down and didn't take no for an answer. Isn't that how it feels? I mean, I'm certainly not a Calvinist, but I can understand how some people get there because it just feels like God didn't take no for an answer. Like, man, he kept pursuing me. He just kept going after me. And then finally, I relented. I, ah, yes, Lord. And, and the longer that I know the Lord, the more I understand grace, the harder it is to comprehend. It's like when David said, what is man that you are mindful of him? What is man? What are we anyways that you would care so much? You start to feel that way. There are moments that you have with the Lord where you really begin to think like, wow, God could have just scrapped us. Now, I know that's not encouraging either today. <laughs> he could have. He could have just done it over and done it over again, but he didn't. He loves you. He loves me. And this is grace. It's nothing that I've done. It's nothing that you've done. We could never earn it. There's, there's no amount of performance that we can give to God. Our pitiful performance is nothing. Now, let me encourage you a little more. The Bible says in Romans, <laughs> Paul says that our righteousness is filthy rags. You ever seen a filthy rag? You get done cleaning your car after far too long and you look at that rag and you have to make a decision. Should I wash this or just throw it away? <laughs> Let's be honest. Some of us, we throw it away. Like I'm not cleaning that. Filthy rags. On your best day, the best moment of your best day in terms of righteousness in comparison to Jesus, it's filthy. But praise be to God that he didn't look at our performance. It was our putting faith into Jesus. It's his grace, what he did for us. Man, that's just, just undo us. Come on, Good Friday's coming. Make plans. Make plans. It should just undo us. And, and sometimes it doesn't, if we're honest. Sometimes it doesn't. So from the day that we come to Christ and we're feeling all that gratitude, it seems like if we're not careful, the further away that we get from that day, the more we forget the grace of God. And here's what happens when you forget the grace of God. When you forget the grace of God, you forget to give the grace of God. When you forget the grace of God, you forget to give the, the grace of God. And that's what happened to the Pharisees. Isn't that what they embodied? I know we pick on them, but Jesus confronted them again and again because even though they had zeal for God, it wasn't in keeping with the heart of God. That's for sure. In, in 1 Corinthians, Paul says this as we think about 
the grace of God and his calling in our life. He said, verse 26, for consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. I, I would feel a certain way about that. <laughs> you ever read this and you're thinking, man, he's, he's, he's saying that about me. <laughs> you're not wise, you're not noble, you're not mighty, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world, and the despise God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. Look at what he's saying. All of the stuff that we have is from God, because of Jesus. It's because of Christ Jesus. He's the wisdom from God. He's the righteousness. He's the sanctification. Friends, if we've got him, we've got all of that. So that just as it, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. We have no boast but to boast in the Lord. That's our boast, not how good we are. And when we think like that, when we remember that our boast is in God, it is not that difficult to give the same grace to other people because we want to. We know who we were, we don't forget where we came from. Maybe it is that James is reminding people where they came from, and we tend to forget where we come from. God help us, help us to remember the grace, help us to give the grace freely as it's been freely given. The third point um, is this, showing favoritism ignores the word of God. Verse eight, if however you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well, but if you show partiality or favoritism, you are committing sin and you're convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. I mean, he's just going for it here, isn't he? <laughs> this is a reiteration of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. James appealed to the church based on God's word from Old Testament uh, to New Testament. We find love your neighbor as yourself. That's Leviticus chapter 19, eight, verse 18. And then of course, Jesus' question about it. And that was his response in Luke chapter 10 and verse 25. He uses this term. It's a strange term. He says the royal law, follow the royal law. What does that mean? James is the only one that uses it. Nobody else uses this terminology. So it's kind of weird. You can skip past it. He uses two terms. One is the royal law and the other is the law of liberty. The royal law, I believe, means the king's law. And here's what I think it is. It's the Old Testament law summarized and reiterated in the teaching of Jesus. The royal law is the king's law. Well, there's only one king, and that's Jesus. So Jesus actually repeats, reiterates, and summarizes Old Testament law that translates under the new covenant. That's what it's saying. It's also, if you were to take Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments, several of them focus on loving God, and the rest focus on loving others, right? So it's a summary of the law. This is the king's law, the royal law. I think it's kind of cool. He makes up his own words. Good job, James. Then he gives an example. He's reminding people of, of the Bible. This is what the Bible says. Listen, if I can't give you an example, rich man, poor man, here's what happens. And maybe people say, well, that's not me. Then he just goes, well, what? here's what the Bible says. Love your neighbor as yourself. And clearly, this scripture keeps coming up. So loving our neighbor is a problem. It's, it's a problem that we have, and maybe it's not so clear. So in J Luke chapter 10, Jesus is asked by a lawyer a question, and here's what it says. A lawyer stood up and put Jesus to the test, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul, your strength and your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Those are two different, different commands, and he brings them together. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But watch this. Wishing to justify himself, the lawyer said, and who is my neighbor? And that's the question, isn't it? Who is my neighbor? And Jesus says, and he gives them this story. And the conclusion of that story is your neighbor is anyone and everyone you encounter, especially those that are suffering that we tend to overlook. That's the story. 
That's the story that Jesus, that Jesus gives in that passage. Treating everyone fairly and loving everyone without prejudice will literally keep us from all kinds of sin. Because it is in doing so, as we treat people unfairly and we show favoritism, we don't realize it, but we actually are sinning against a lot of other people who we are overlooking. I want you to see this. James is actually getting at the core of the problem. One of the reasons we can say, yes, I know that we're supposed to care for the widow and the orphan, but we don't do it. One of the reasons is because we're too busy focusing on people and things that we ought not focus on. And it's creating all kinds of sin around us that we are blind to and we do not see. That's why the ad- admonition of scripture, the commands of scripture are so important, even though we would say, yeah, of course. Why would you even need to say that? The reason is, is because we have a tendency not to do those things. And you know, it's funny, the older we get, we, we tend to act like, you know, we need to focus on the deep things of scripture. We need to dive deep into this book. I would tell you, friends, the hard things of scripture are loving people. Come on, that was, that was not as good as it should have been. <laughs> I felt it though, I felt it. Right, loving people. Like how many of you are experts at loving people? Go ahead and raise your hand. Come on, all right. I just want to see if somebody just woke up. Yeah, I'm pretty good at that. I was... <laughs> we tend to avoid um, not just harder passages, but harder parts. I will admit to you, yeah, I'm challenged every season of my life to love someone. I'm challenged. And it isn't because I'm the lovable lovely and they're not. It's because I have issues just like they do. I have issues just like they do. This was a glaring fault to the Pharisees and Jesus confronted them. Read this, I wanna read this to you. Matthew 23, 23. Jesus, of course, speaks to this many times. James is. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin, but you have neglected the weightier provisions of the law. Justice, mercy, that's towards other people, faithfulness, But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. You should have tithed all your stuff. That's great. But these are the weightier matters you've neglected for the things that aren't as important. You blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. That's a weird comment, isn't it? I was like, I'm going to use that in parenting. Like, talk to your kids. You you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. (laughs) Your four-year-old would be like, They have a stuffed animal that's a camel. It'll change their whole experience, by the way. (laughs) Edit that, please. We just want (laughs) to. Jesus confronted them for majoring on the minors. Isn't that that whole bad religion thing versus pure religion? You major on the minors. You build a religious scaffolding that makes you feel good, makes you look good, but it doesn't do good to other people. That's, that's bad religion. It's that scaffolding. And you know what it eventually does? It hurts people. It hurts all of us. Wonder where church hurt comes from. It comes from a lot of places. Some of our prodigals did not just walk away from God because they just wanted sin. Some people get hurt. Some people walk away because they, they get hurt. And I'm thankful that Jesus is a healer. Je- Jesus is, is, is a healer. So what's the application point? Keep God's word in front of you and prioritize the weightier things that Jesus did that we would also do in the same way. Amen. Last point here, showing favoritism forgets the judgment of God. Look at verse 12 and 13. Of course, James, in the way that he teaches, he has to just sum it all up with some complexity. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy, for mercy triumphs over judgment. Scholars have been debating this passage for many, many years, and I don't think I'm going to be able to clean it up for you entirely today. I wouldn't be arrogant enough to think that. Here's what I think, because this this is a real debate, scholarly, theological debate as to what this, this all means. But that doesn't let you out of it. Like, oh, cool, then I don't have to conclude. No, 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 no. (laughs) Sometimes, anyways. Both Jesus and Paul, John chapter five, Romans eight, taught that Christians will not be judged for their sin. I want you to lock this in. Everybody listening? 
Jesus and Paul throughout scripture in the New Testament under the new covenant, we are not going to be judged for our sin. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Right, we believe that or we don't. Did Jesus pay for our sin? Right, the blood of rams and goats, right, is not sufficient. But the blood of Jesus Christ, the precious blood of Jesus that's worth more than silver and gold, it cleanses us from all unrighteousness and sets us right, sanctifies us. It sets us apart so that we are now in relationship with God. There is absolutely no way that we are gonna stand before God with our sins. And I don't want you to be confused about that. Jesus paid for our sin. You're either under the blood or you're not. That's a fact. See, in judgment, the Bible talks about the great white throne of judgment. The Lamb's book of life opens, right? So we're talking about we pass through. If you're in Christ, if you are born again, if you're a Christian, you pass through that judgment. But there's a second judgment that I believe James is talking about, Paul talks about it, and Jesus does as well. In a, his language is a little different. But we will be judged and rewarded according to our works. If you're a Christian, you will not be judged for your sin. Jesus was judged enough. Jesus paid on the cross. It says that all of our sin, the penalty, the punishment of us all was placed on him. In Christ, that's where the penalty goes. But we will be judged for our works and we'll, we will be rewarded according to our works as well. So Christians stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for their life. Here's what I wanna say to you today. It's not just a warning, it's an opportunity. That you and I are gonna stand before Jesus and give an account for our works. What did we do with Jesus and what did we do with what Jesus said? First Corinthians chapter three says it this way that as we stand at the judgment seat of Christ, everything that is not what God wanted us to do, it will be burned up like wood, hay, and stubble. And the only thing left is gold and silver refined in the fire. The only thing left is truly what we did in obedience to Jesus. That's all that's left. That's all that we hold in our hands. And it's whatever that is, that's what we are rewarded by. Did we live this life in the way that God called us to. So when James says, live your life, so speak and so act as those who understand you are gonna be judged according to the way you lived your life. I know it's not a popular message today and you can go home and probably still catch Joel Osteen on TBN. We love Brother Joel. But I'd be wrong and we would be wrong to not tell each other at times that we're gonna be judged for what we did with what Jesus said. Friends, you don't escape it, you won't escape it. And this is not just to be fearful. I know we preach judgment to be fearful, but let me tell you something else, is that we now have an opportunity to live like Jesus, to love like Jesus, to speak like Jesus, to minister like Jesus. And if we do that, we get rewarded by Jesus. James doesn't say that the law so speaks, so acts as those who know they're gonna be judged according to the law. He says the law of liberty, the law that sets you free so that you can serve God. The law that's enabled you and empowered you, the law of freedom, empowered by the Spirit of God, etched now on your hearts that you and I can live our life and serve like Jesus in the world around us. It's very different than the fear that we're often so accustomed to. James isn't just trying to make people afraid. Oh, I better be scared. I'm going to kill me. God's going to strike me. Some people talk like that. They preach like that. No, no, no. What about as sons and daughters of God who have a reverence for the Father and want to? Everybody, if you're a Christian, don't you want to live for God? You want to. You don't always do it, but you want to. That the Spirit lives there, and He's compelling you, crying out, Abba, Father. It's a desire in our heart. If the desire to love and serve God is not there, friends, most likely we're just not a Christian. And we need to reconcile that with God. The Spirit of God live inside of us, the Word of God etched on our hearts. But when that's true, we want to serve, love God. And so we live in a way recognizing that one day we're not just gonna live for Jesus, but we're gonna stand in front of Jesus and say, here, this is what I did. And he says, well done, good and faithful. Yeah. It's not about perfection. 
It's about serving him in a way that shows that we love him, that we love him. And if we're gonna do that, we're gonna love people as he has. Our words are gonna be judged. Our deeds are gonna be judged. And favoritism makes us judges of others with evil motives, when the fact is we're gonna be judged ourselves. We're gonna be judged ourselves. When people play favorites of some, we automatically judge others and we miss, as he talks about showing the mercy of God. We miss showing the mercy of God. He says, mercy triumphs over judgment. First, he says, judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown mercy. That's a fact. That's not just fear, it's a fact. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. And so it's a reiteration of Matthew chapter five in the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, he's saying it the opposite way. Those who have not shown mercy, to them the judgment will be merciless. They think something else is gonna happen, but they don't realize it's gonna be a little bit different when they stand before Jesus. But then he says, mercy triumphs over judgment. And friends, the world needs to see this radical mercy that we've received from God. And they're gonna see it through the way that we live too. I pray that God doesn't have to overlook us and use someone else because we're unwilling to show the mercy of Jesus. We're thankful for for what God has done. I'll close with, uh, with this. How many of you, you grew up and you uh, started out, you knew you weren't gonna be a professional sports person. I mean, I actually know people listening, uh, there's somebody listening to me right now, professional uh, athlete, right? We've ha- we have professional athletes around us, but most of us are not that. What's it, like one in a million or a billion? I don't know how, how many, what your chances are. <laughs> Sorry, young people. <laughs> you killed my dreams. Um, but you, you start out and you want to play sports, and I wanted to play basketball. But I was, I was heavy. I was, uh, when I was a kid, I was, I was uh, pretty, pretty overweight. And so, like many people, I was not chosen or I was chosen last. Anybody experience this? Yeah, and what happens when that's you, uh, this wasn't just once or twice. Like, Ben, why'd you bring up the once or twice? It was actually my whole grade school experience. And some of you have experienced that, but we've all experienced it to a degree. And so you're standing there, there's just nothing like standing there waiting to be chosen, and you're you're hoping that they choose you like, okay, maybe they won't choose me first, but what about second? I'll take a solid third, right? And now you're counting down, and you're looking, now it's you and Tommy or Susan, and you're like, choose me, you know, choose me. I know, if I used your name, I apologize. I try not to make eye contact, you know, when I say a name, like especially when you're bringing up biblical stories that are rough. But when when you don't get chosen, you feel rejection. You feel rejection. Personal rejection is so powerful. It cripples us, right? It cripples us. You feel rejected because you weren't chosen or you weren't looked at in a way that you wanted to, wanted to be. Everybody wants to be valued, loved, cherished, for sure, for sure. Here's the truth though. God in Christ values, loves, and cherishes us beyond what any other human could ever do. That's that, the gospel of Jesus is that in Christ, God has given us a type of love that is indescribable. It's without comprehension. This love, this kind of love, this kind of mercy that he, that he shows, it breaks the power of all personal rejection. Some of us have experienced that personal rejection, but here's what James is talking about. Don't, don't play life the same way that some of us play sports, where we choose the ones that we want on our team because we want to win, because we want to be someone and we want to be somewhere and we want to have something. I'll tell you, a lot of people play the game of life that way. The people that they talk to, the people that they minister to, the people that they love, the people that they favor are the ones that help them get the edge. And it's sin. And our world might be that way, but we can't be that way. Our world might think that's normal, but to the Christian, that's abnormal. That is not our way. That is not who we are. And so we have Jesus as our example, who is no respecter of persons. And he ministers to us and he wants to minister through us. And those that show mercy towards other people release the virtue of Jesus. It's not virtue signaling like we have today. 
It's real virtue, the true virtue of Christ. It's not fake, it's not a show, it's not I like and love and favor someone so that everyone online will know that I care. It's actual stopping and seeking to love people and to lift them up. May God help us to do this. It will literally change our world. While politics talk about it, Christians live it. Christians ought to live it, amen? Would you stand to your feet, let's pray. I want to um, just pray that God would help us with this, but would you, would you mind just bow your heads as we pray in the presence of God? I was thinking about that whole thing of personal rejection this morning and kind of meditating on how that's true, and I just want to tell you this morning that God can break the power of rejection in our life. I know that's not entirely what the sermon's about, but some of us have experienced favoritism and not just shown it, and it's affected us to where we feel personal rejection. We feel the pain of it. And maybe we're living under that label and we feel not seen, not loved, not cared for, not known. I just want to tell you that the Holy Spirit wants to break the power of that. He does. Don't live under that label. God loves you more than you could ever know. That's the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Receive that love today and let him break every other label, no matter how you've been treated. Let God break that label over you. Amen. Father, we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus that you've done for us in Christ what we cannot do for ourselves. And we value you above all else, Lord. It's who you are. It's what you've done. It's what you're still doing. And God, we repent, Lord, if we are showing favoritism. Father, we repent. Show us where that is the case and help us not to do that. In fact, Lord, we pray that you would help us to go after those who are suffering, who are struggling. Give us eyes to see. Give us ears to hear. Give us hearts to respond to lay aside what the world accommodates in showing favoritism to get something out of anybody. Help us to be people that are selfless, that give to everyone, that love and treat equally. Help us to do that, Lord, in a world that tips the scales, in a world that is unfair. Help us not be like that. God, help us by your grace today. Remind us of what you've done for us. Help us to do the same. And Father, I pray over anyone today that's experiencing the pain and the power of personal rejection. I pray that you would break its power over us in the mighty name of Jesus, that we would not live under the pain of rejection, that what anybody has done to us could never be stronger than what you've done for us. Father, I pray you would obliterate that over our life today. We receive it. We thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name and all God's people said, amen and amen.